Now let's commence a little time of praise just as we settle our hearts and come into God's presence on a new Lord's Day morning. There's nothing better than being able to say, I will serve thee because I love thee. And of course, we say that we love him because he first loved us. Let's commence with this lovely chorus. I will serve thee because I love thee. Sing it twice through. is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain, who plumbed the depths of my disgrace and gave me life again. Sing it thoughtfully.
been thinking a lot this week about this great hymn of Joseph Scriven. What a friend we have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear. Let's sing this one too. exactly what we need to do when we're weary with life and worn out by all that the battles of life bring to us. Here's a lovely one to finish with. Be still for the presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here. Oh, 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 oh,
Father, what we have just been singing together is the prayer of our hearts today. We pray that by your Spirit you might move in our hearts, in our homes, in our land, and in this place today. Come amongst us and do us good, we ask, in the sea of your precious name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand, sing after the introduction these great words, Christ triumphant, ever reigning, Savior, Master, King. Now let's come quietly again as we come to commit ourselves to the Lord this morning, praying for his blessing on us, for those who can't be here, and praying for others who minister God's word today. The psalmist says, I will lift up mine eyes onto the hills, from whence cometh our help, my help comes from the Lord. Our God and our Father, we come to you in the worthy name of your Son, the one we have been singing about just now. And we enter your holy presence, longing to be still before you, realizing that as the world in which we live rushes on, your word encourages us to be still and to know that you are God. You are the great creator God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the God of our salvation. 
we come to you humbly and very reverently, realizing, our Father, that we are what we are by the grace of God. There is nothing outside of Christ that would commend us to you today. And so we come in the Savior's name and we wait quietly around your great throne of grace. And Father, we bring you our praise and our worship and our adoration. We thank you that your word tells us that you are a great God and greatly to be praised. You're a God who gives us everything that we need in life. You're a God who provides far more than we will ever need. And today we say it individually, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Father, we come to thank you for the week that has gone out into eternity with all the ups and downs of our journey, with all the blessings and all the battles. We thank you we can come on this new Lord's Day morning and we can meet together to praise and to magnify your great name and to sit under the authority of your holy word. Father, we bless you for the past week. We thank you for every token of grace and mercy and love that has been our portion. But our Father, we come to you now and we come to pray for your hand to be upon each one of us gathered in this church building and those who listen in live on Facebook just now. You know us individually and you know our needs. Father, there may be some here this morning who are struggling with life. For them, it has been a difficult week. For them, our Father, the battles have been more than they've been able to bear. And they're here just now and they need to hear a word from the Lord. There are those, our Father, who, because of disobedience like Jonah, are not in the place spiritually where they ought to be. And for such, our Father, we all pray that you would have something to say to our hearts today. Some don't know Christ yet and lovingly we pray for them, tenderly we plead for them and ask that by your Spirit you would draw them to repentance and to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we're all here this morning. We've come from different homes with different needs. Please hear our prayers and come down and be one of our number and minister to us like you alone can. Remember those who are not well who'd love to be here, we pray our Father for Jim in hospital today, for Tommy going into hospital on Thursday. We pray for those who have been in recently and have just returned home and Father, we continue to pray your hand of blessing to be upon them. We think of Serena this morning. We think of we Poppy. And we commend each one of them to you and ask as you see their different needs. Father, that you will move your hand in grace and in healing and that you will work out your purposes in these situations. Remember everywhere else where your word will be preached today. Father, we ask that God's blessing will attend to the needs of those who minister your word Give them great grace, empower them by your Spirit, enable them to proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ. For those further afield who have gone out to serve you in the great mission fields of the world in which we live, bless them today. Those whom we know and those whom we don't know, we commend them to your care and ask that liberally by your Spirit you'll minister to them and through them to the hearts of others. So, Father, hear our cries as we come just now. Bless Ivan as he will speak to us later and share with us with all that you've done through our Holiday Bible Club. And we only can say today how good is the God we adore. So hear our prayers and bless us, we ask, as we continue on in your presence just now. And we ask it all giving thanks in the sea of your precious name. 
Amen. Amen. Now let me bid you all a very warm welcome as you come to join with us this morning. I know folks are still coming and going because it's a holiday period, but we're so glad to see each one of you as you come and join with us today, and especially if you're visiting, you're very, very welcome. Good to have Pastor Jonathan and the family with us this morning too, and you're very welcome also. Now bear with me just for a moment or two as I make the necessary announcements. After the ministry of God's Word, we meet around the Lord's table, and we come to do so to remember the Lord Jesus Christ as He has commanded us to do. If you're saved and you're walking in fellowship with the Lord, then please wait with us as we break bread together. Now, Selina Fairburn, Alicia Baxter, and Rachel Shaw are responsible for Christ's duty today. We meet again at a quarter to six tonight for our prayer time, which precedes our gospel meeting at half past six. God willing, I will be preaching at that, and we're going to be thinking tonight, we're going to make sure that we're ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. So come along tonight and meet with us around God's word. Tuesday night, 7.30, will be the elders' meeting. Wednesday night, 8 o'clock through to 9, will be our prayer meeting, and I'll be responsible for that. Then Friday, 12.15, Friday Bible study, Corinth, the Messy Church, and that's with Woody. And then our services next Lord's Day commence 10.45 10.45 with our prayer meeting, 11.30 the morning meeting and breaking of bread. Beverly will be speaking to the children, Caroline, Serena and Jasmine Carson will be on Christ's duty, God willing, next week. Then 5.45 again our prayer meeting, 6.30 the gospel meeting, God willing, I'll be preaching at both those services. Now regards our missionary convention, the leaflets are now available And if you pick one of these up, you'll see that uh, with a good, varied number of speakers coming to our missionary convention. So please take one of those with you if you haven't already done so. If you're visiting today, uh, you can take one too. And if you want to come back and join with us some night during that convention, please do feel free to do that. Now, helping others worldwide, the Don't forget that these also, these leaflets are sitting outside. Let me just clarify something. If you take one inside, you will see in the middle page, we want to help equip this clinic, a list of what is needed. So just after the green box, there's a yellow box with all the things that are needed to go out on this trip. So take one with you. If you can help out in any way, please do and bring what you can for that appeal. Now, Sunday school, the planning has commenced for the return of Sunday school and some additional help is needed. We're in need of a teacher, someone to support a teacher in the junior class and some substitute teachers to cover whenever that is required. Would you please prayerfully consider this? And if you can support the work of the Sunday school in one of these ways, then please speak with Andrew Shaw about that. For those engaged in children's talks, the rotas are now available out on the foyer. Now, I've been approached about church membership. If you're interested in church membership, or perhaps you're interested in going through the waters of baptism, would you please see me about either of those matters as soon as possible? These are all the announcements to be made subject, as always, to the sovereign will of of God. Now, recently we had a good holiday Bible club. Ivan is going to come and bring a report on that for us today. Thanks, Ivan. You ever get the feeling you were in the right place at the wrong time? Don't know how I ever got involved in the run of it this year, but anyway, God, God led us, um, and that's the way it was. I have to say, one word I can probably summarize um, Holiday Bible Club this year is wow, what a year. Um, it was fantastic from start to finish. If you've seen everybody's faces, I think everybody enjoyed it. Well, I hope they did. They maybe went home and said they didn't, but the faces on everybody that was there, children, leaders, everything was just, it would just give you a buzz every night. It was absolutely fantastic. 
I'm going to run a few pictures here, um, just let you see some of what went on. Apologies if you're not in the, if you were there and some, we didn't get pictures of everybody. Um, so the construction started well in advance. Um, obviously we talk about having um, gifts in the church and some people don't think they have gifts or they're not sure what their gifts are. There's one fella sits up in the back and if you tell him you're going to build something, he gets all excited and that was Marcus. You see, whenever I said, we're going to build a castle. Well, honestly, it was like giving that fella a million pounds. So this was the construction underway. And here you can have the, the, some of the boys, Colin and Eddie and Marcus, out. And this is the construction, I can't remember, the Thursday night, I think the, the week before. Um, on that same night, we put out for help to come and paint all this. And maybe my faith wasn't great, but I mean, we had such a group here on that Thursday night. And they started painting this wall to make it look like a castle. And the paint stayed pretty much on the wall where it was meant to. It did go maybe a few other places, but it wasn't too bad. And I have to say thank you to everybody that did come that night. I honestly did not believe there was going to be so many came, and we were overwhelmed with the help that we got. And the girls came, and they really got into this painting. Um, it was absolutely fantastic. And you can see it's starting to take shape there and starting to look like the thing. Um, I think sometimes if you actually have something practical like that, sometimes people really get buzzed, you know, they really get into it and they really get excited about it, and it gives you a real buzz to it about the whole thing. You can see here, they were just mad keen, just give them the paintbrush, slap it on the wall, away they went, and they had such fun. <laughs> I did actually do something, I wasn't just sitting there doing nothing. Eddie, he was doing windows at this stage, and I thought, well, I have, there's a lady on, on the right of me, but I didn't put a picture because she'd give off to me, because apparently she said she didn't look good on it, so I just cut her out of that. And this was then the hall um, with Port Collis and stuff, just sort of finishing off and coming um, to the final point, and then the hall. So I don't know if, if any of you didn't see it. That was the finished effect of it. Um, and it really did look the part. It really was brilliant. Um, and that was even before we got started. So there was a lot of work that went into the stages up to this. Um, but it was really, really enjoyable. And to be honest, we talk about having fellowship. It was great fellowship having the Thursday night. A great bit of laugh and a great bit of crack. And sometimes, you know, we miss out on all these things. We talk about fellowship, and maybe we don't really get the right sort of fellowship. We had the younger ones there. It was great, really, really good fun, really enjoyable. And yet we were all there for God's glory. We were all doing work for God to see that children would come the following week and learn about him. So then obviously the week came. Couldn't believe it came. And we had such a band of helpers, and as you can see, the girls all smiling. This was, I think... I'm not sure whether this was Monday night, but they were still smiling at guests on Friday night. So it must have been doing something right. And they were just so happy to be there. They really were enjoying every minute of it. Even in the kitchen, they was working on the kitchen, prep, preparing for crafts and doing all sorts of things. And here we have um, courses. Every night we did courses. As you can see, we had a, a few wee things just in the church. A bit of bunting and a couple of flags as well on the theme of what we were doing was come and meet the king so you know jesus is the king and so you can see the children all up there really really enjoying it um the leaders are all getting into it as well and there's some aged stand up in the background there with his hands in there i don't know who he was he kept coming along every night couldn't get rid of him so as you can see here they really really love it give them a few courses and they really really enjoy everything about it they're just buzzing um, but you know it's not all about courses we're not here just to teach them courses um, much as it's fun there's other things going on yes we had games and you can see again how the games um, were going on here and everybody again getting involved in it mums and every leaders all sorts this was actually on, on the final night some of these pictures were taken so some of the parents were there and here we have memory verses so again we were learning memory verses we learned four memory verses over the week which I'll mention just in a minute or two um, but again, they're all mad keen to get up the front to get reciting the memory verses. You know, you think sometimes that you're not doing anything or you're not having an effect or you're not, you know, there's nothing going on. And you see the like of these wee ones coming up and you've taught them a memory verse and they're mad keen to get reciting it. And maybe you think to yourself, oh, it's just, just a memory verse. Them reciting it, you don't know what, what that's doing. That's planting into them. You're creating a wee foundation in them. And that's for, that might be with them the rest of their lives. And there may be some time down the years. We don't know what the future holds for these children. But down the years, that verse may come back to them in a time of need. And the Lord might speak to them through that. So, you know, don't think that we're ever doing this. Just There's no reason behind it. 
we're actually serving the Lord and we're helping to plant the seed and we are then relying on God to actually to bring that seed to fruition. So there's crafts every night as well. There's different crafts, shields and flags and all sorts of things were done. And again, they really do seem to love the crafts. There's a lot of work involved in the crafts. So again, for those that got involved behind the scenes, thank you very much. There's really a lot of work to have a different craft every night. And then we're having four different groups um, on, their, on a 15 minute turnaround, which is really quite quick. So we're asking quite a lot. But here is the fun bit of it all, I think. This, this to me just made it all so worthwhile. It was King of Kings, so yeah, they actually got to meet the kings, and I had left it up um, each night to the girls that were doing the questioning, so it was like a question interview sort of a thing. Um, and so the leg of King David here was in behind the castle, and then they had to get him out through the door and then get talking to him. And certainly some of the kids got a bit carried away with questions and whatnot. But we had King David on Monday night, and the verse on Monday night was Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So you were thinking about King David and King and uh, uh, John Goliath, and how without God's strength, um, David would not have overcome Goliath. I mean, that was not of Goliath. As in, in our work and what we do, anything we do is not of us. We're there doing what God wants us to do. So there's nothing involved in any of this of what I have done. It's all God's work through me, and I don't want to take any glory for what has happened. It's all down to God. We give thanks to God for that. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's what we find with David. Then on Tuesday night we had King Josiah, the youngest king. And we learned in Psalm 56 verse 3, Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. He, came, he was a king at the age of eight. So you can, be, you can imagine if you have a son or a daughter at eight, um, how frightening that must have been to actually be king authority over a country, over a, over a nation. So he was able, like Josiah walked very closely with God throughout his life. And that's all we ask of the boys and girls too. If we can plant this seed, that they will also walk through their lives with God. So everything that happens, they can come to them and ask them. Then we had King Solomon, the wisest of all the kings. And we learned in Psalm 136 and 1, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. You know, King Solomon asked God for wisdom and he got wisdom. And he got great things throughout this. But being such a wise man and walking with God, he also then lost sight of God. And he also re- sort of got caught up in himself. And with all the wisdom that he had, and even though he was walking with God at one stage, he became self-indulgent. Um, he then just forgot about God and how what God had looked after him. And he did majorly bad things, fell away from God. But, you know, he came back to God and asked for forgiveness. And, you know, God's mercy endures for us today. And we can call on him at any stage. And then on the Thursday night, we had King Ahab. Now, this is obviously King Ahab's the most evil king. But as some of the children called him, it's the grumpy head. So as you can see from the picture, okay, maybe it's a bit grumpy. But I have to say, Marcus did play his role very well. Um... And we learned, obviously, from King Ahab being known as the wickedest king in the Bible. We did John 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The reason of that verse, Ahab had many, many opportunities through life um, to come to God. God had shown his power to him several times, and he was very close to it. But in the end, he didn't accept God, and he died in his death. Um, And, you know, we know that we have the reassurance through Jesus that we have um, the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me, except through Jesus today. You know, but as they were asking questions, sometimes there were some really interesting questions asked. And this next picture will probably summarize just how awkward some of the questions were. (laughs) I don't know what the question was that Marcus was asking this, but it must have been a real good one for a face like that. And that's, that's just puzzlement there and bewilderment. But, you know, there were some really interesting questions asked, but I have to say in all, there was a lot of fun had and a lot of enjoyment. And I honestly do believe that the Lord used this work this week to really instill into the hearts and the, and the minds of the boys and girls. And sometimes you have to use visual things. Obviously, the Friday night then we had Bouncy Castle. This is me doing health and safety inspection at the time. Um, I wasn't enjoying myself at all. Nearly got stuck in the ball pit. 
Um, but, you know, we use all manners of things to get people in. I honestly do believe that the, the kings and having the interview, um, God had laid that in my heart that that was the way to do it this year. And the children were buzzing about it. The children were remembering what was going on and having great fun. And we need to have fun. We need to have it enjoyable, but we need the same be thing be teaching about God's word um, and making sure the boys and girls learn this. There's some of the boys and girls on the Friday night. Um, what I hadn't said right enough going on, we had actually on average 109 children every night. It started off a wee bit higher and then um, dropped down, but we managed to keep really good numbers. So an average of 109 children um, over the week. I think on the final night then we had about 230 odd um, children and parents as well. Many of them not connected to this church, maybe not connected, connected to any church that we even know of. So we made contact with 230, 230 so um, people on the Friday night. It was really, really good. And there we are, we have the barbecue. Um, so it's always good to finish off a week with a, your belly filled with food. Um, it was a really great week, really, really blessed. I have to say a big thank you to everybody that took time out to help this year in whatever way it was, should have been in the planning, the organising, all of those things that went on. It was a fantastic week, and we give God the glory for everything that went on that week. And, you know, as we do this work, we're there for the children, but we've also got to remember as well, we're also there for the other um, leaders as well. A lot of the younger leaders, and we had some very young leaders this year came forward, and I have to say, I was so blessed to have them there. Really was chuffed to be there. And, um, you know, we have to be seen as encouragers as well and to support the younger ones coming up through the church. Not only do we have to give the word out to those that maybe don't or don't go to church, but we also need to be seen as encouragers. And sometimes I think we don't do that. I know sometimes I maybe don't do that either. And maybe that's something that we should do more of, encourage. We can all find faults in people. It's so easy to do. And I know I can do that so easy. But maybe we should be looking for all the positives and actually encouraging all the younger helpers, all the younger ones in the church, to build them up and not knock them down. This place would be such a wonderful place to be if we all built each other up and the fun and enjoyment that we would have. You'd be coming through that door with a big smile on your face and you'd be leaving with a big smile on your face. Wouldn't that be a wonderful place to be? But, you know, we're just going to finish off a chorus. And I was tempted to do some of the courses that we had done during the week, but I might have got put out through the door, so we didn't bother. And so we're just going to do God is so good. Because of Holiday Bible Club, because of the week we had, we know that God is so good. He showed it to us that week, and the numbers of children that came through the door, the faces, the enjoyment, how they learned memory verses. They went away with their wee shields and their flags, with wee um, Bible verses, with wee bits of information on them, away rushing home to tell their mums and dads. You know, God is wonderful. And sometimes we forget how wonderful God is. God supplies all our needs, day in, day out. Whatever we have, we can thank God for it. And maybe sometimes you don't think there is anything to give thanks to God. There's always something to give thanks to God for. We all as Christians go through hard times. It's not easy, but God's there as we learn through the verses. He learned to strengthen me. I can trust him when I'm afraid. He has his mercy endures forever. And also he is the way to God today. So we're just going to sing this. Now, there is actions to this, so I'm not sure. No actions to the first one. Don't know about the rest, but we'll give it a go anyway. <laughs> Yeah. 
Well, thanks to Ivan for that report. If you hadn't been down and seen this going on, you'd have realised just how good it was and how blessed the folk were who had come to it. Now, turn with me, please, in your Bible. We're turning back to the book of Jonah. And we're turning to Jonah chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2, and we're going to read together from this book that we have been thinking about in Sunday mornings past. Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto (coughs) the Lord his God out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about all thy billows, and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me around about, the weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Amen. God will add his blessing to the reading of his word. For a number of weeks now, we have been looking at this little book, the book of Jonah, and we've been thinking about this reluctant missionary. God, of course, had commissioned Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh, and there he was to cry out. He was to preach to this great city where hundreds of thousands of people were abiding under the wrath of God, and they needed to hear the word of God. And we followed Jonah in the storm out of the boat. And last time we came to look at Jonah in the belly of the great fish. This was a fish that God had designated. God had appointed it for that particular occasion and for the purpose of swallowing up Jonah. And last week we looked at Jonah's prayer to God because Jonah now in the belly of this great fish, began to pray. I'm sure you and I have prayed from many different situations in life, but this is one place we've never, ever prayed from, the belly of a great fish. We began last Sunday morning by noting the fellowship that Jonah enjoyed. Whenever the sailors had thrown Jonah over the side of the ship. I'm sure that Jonah might have felt at times this this was the end. He had disobeyed God. He had gone on the run. He had run away from God, and he found himself now in a situation where these hardened sailors, in order to bring peace in the midst of a storm, they took Jonah and they threw him over the side of the boat. But God had designated this fish to swallow up Jonah And God wasn't yet finished with his servant. He was on the run from God, but the running was now over. God was going to deal with him. God was going to chasten him. God was going to restore him. And then God would soon recommission him back again to the work. Now, when we thought about Jonah's prayer. We saw the prayer that Jonah made. We're told in a very difficult situation simply that he prayed instinctively. 
He turned to the God that he had run away from in the midst of a crisis, and Jonah prayed. You see, Jonah had got out of the habit of praying. Even when he was on the ship with these hardened sailors and the winds were blowing and the ship was being tossed to and fro in the storm that God had sent, Jonah was asleep. He was asleep down at the bottom of the boat and there he was resting while these sailors who knew nothing of Jonah's God were crying out to their gods and they were looking for something to happen. But now that has passed. And Jonah has now been in the sea and then in the belly of this great fish and it says, he prayed. Beloved, don't ever get out of the habit of praying. It's the easiest thing in the world for any one of us to do. You know how it is. In the midst of distress or in a crisis in our life, we feel compelled to be driven to God upon our knees and crying out to him because we can't do anything without him. And somehow when the distress is over and everything has settled down, we stop praying. But never get out of the habit of praying because that's what had happened, Jonah. And now in the belly of this great fish, he prayed. It says, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. But secondly, we noted the place where Jonah prayed. He prayed to God out of the fish's belly. That encourages me. You see, no matter who we are today, no matter where we are today, and no matter what we're going through in life, we can pray to God at any time. We can pray to God anywhere. It doesn't matter the circumstances. God is only a prayer away. That's why we sing this morning that great hymn by Scriven. What a friend we have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. You see, beloved, that's why we need to maintain a prayer life. God is only a prayer away. And God, yes, he knows what's on our heart at any given moment of time. He knows what we're passing through in our journey through life. But God delights in the prayers of his children. So make time for prayer. I want to pick this story up again this morning. We've noted the fellowship Jonah enjoyed. He prayed on to the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. Here's the second thing. I want you to see the feelings that Jonah expressed. Look at these opening three verses in Jonah 2 for a moment. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hadst cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Now I tell you this, you cannot read those words without understanding something of where Jonah was at that time. He opens up his heart to us. He tells it as it is. Sometimes you know somebody's not well or they're going through a situation and then you go to them and you say to them, well, how are you? Oh, I'm fine, Pastor. Or they go to their friend and, oh, well, no, things aren't as bad as it seems. But the problem is often the world is crashing down over the top of them and they're hemmed in and they're swallowed up by the events of life, but they won't say because they're afraid to say, Jonah was in a situation where he tells us as it is. And he tells us what he's going through at this time. And as he expresses his feelings, there is no doubt whatsoever that this was a very personal and a dreadful experience. We know, of course, that this was all of Jonah's own making. He was the one who had run away from God He was the one who had disobeyed God. But you can't help feel for him in the situation that he finds himself in. 
Look at how descriptively he relates to all of this and tells us how he felt. First of all, Jonah was in despair. Jonah was in despair. Jonah speaks about his affliction. Do you know what he says? He says of as if it seemed that he was in the very belly of hell. You can't get much stronger than that. You can't get much deeper than that. Jonah looks at where his disobedience to God had brought him, and as far as he's concerned, this is one of the darkest experiences that Jonah has ever had to come through. And you know what? He's now beginning to realize that it was all of his own making, that his disobedience to God was far more costly than he ever thought it could be. He's in a state of great despair, so bad, he says he's in the belly of hell. Now, when Jonah speaks here of hell, he's speaking of Sheol, which is the word used in the Old Testament to speak of the place of the departed dead. The words used 65 times in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, words like Hades, Gehenna, hell, they're all used to speak of the place of the departed dead. That's a big, big subject. It's not for the sporting. But what this tells us is this. Jonah had fallen so far, he feels he is dead. And he's buried in the body of this great fish. Yet, beloved, at the lowest point in Jonah's life at that time, God knew all about him. Do you know what? Sometimes we all find ourselves where Jonah found himself. Life can treat us badly. And we can be sitting at home in the depth of despair. The first thing we think, nobody cares about me. Nobody calls to see me. Sometimes people don't know that you're in despair if you don't tell them. Sometimes people don't know your personal situation and they don't know mine. But there's one thing absolutely sure. God knows all about it. For God knows who we are and God knows where we are. And God sees us, child of God, when life is filled with despair and there's nowhere else to turn. Look heavenward. Look heavenward. Because you see, God sees you. And God knows all about you. And God assures you, he'll always, always be with you. Jonah relates to his experience. Jonah was in despair. And secondly, Jonah was in deep waters. Now, I'm not saying that the fish was at the bottom of the sea. I'm talking about how Jonah felt. Look at verse 3. For thou hadst cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. That's quite an admission, isn't it? Because now for the first time, Jonah has to admit that it was God's hand that was working behind the scenes in everything in Jonah's life to bring him to this very place. It wasn't the sailors who had thrown him overboard. They were just the instruments that God used. It was a sovereign God who had done this. It was God's way of chastening his servant and it was God's way of rebuking him for his disobedience. Beloved, we all know from experience that like Jonah, when we find ourselves in deep waters, it's not a nice place to be. Now, Jonah was there of his own making. He had run away from God. He had disobeyed God. He had refused his commission and off he went as he thought to Tarsus and now he's in the belly of a fish in the sea. 
And God has put him in a place where Jonah has time to think about himself, about his relationship with God, about all the things that are going on in his life, the things that are wrong and why he found himself there. And God brought him into deep waters. Child of God, I'm going to say this very lovingly. If you know today, sitting in this meeting, that you're away from the Lord, and you have been now for quite a while, or you've just been simply going through the motions with God, you haven't been praying, you haven't been reading, you haven't been walking with God, you haven't been committing every day to God, you haven't been looking to Him because you see you feel you're fine the way you are. What did I even tell the children? What did he tell us this morning? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see the Christian who decides, I'll do it my way. It might be good for a song, but it's not good for the Christian life. Child of God, I say to your heart this morning, and you don't need to put your hand up, answer me, speak to me. I'm saying to you today, listen, if your life has been falling apart recently. Could it be that God has brought you this way in order that you turn around and in the course of life run to God? Run to God. Jonah had run from God. He wouldn't stop running and then God intervened until the time Jonah found himself in the deep waters. As some of you will say to me, Pastor, that's great. Understand that. But you know what? I'm in the midst of deep waters this morning. I've done nothing wrong. I've tried to live an impeccable Christian life. I have prayed. And I have read the Word of God daily and have pleaded with God pleaded with God to bring me to the place where I know deliverance from where I am just now. He hasn't done it. I've lived an impeccable life. And yet I'm still in deep waters. Child of God, sometimes that happens too. Have I an answer for it? No. But there are times in life whenever God seems to take dramatic action. Dramatic to us, just normal for him. And he does it in order to teach us something about life. You say, Pastor, I could well do without what I'm going through. You're not the first to say that. I've said it too on many occasions. But you know what? Sometimes God deals with us physically. He deals with us spiritually. He deals with us emotionally. He deals with us financially. Why? In order to get us to face up to the realities of life. So that in a bad place, so that in distress, so that in the deep waters, we'll look to him and we'll draw from him and we'll walk with him. And we'll realize that in this life in which we live without him, we can do nothing. The fellowship that Jonah enjoyed, the feelings that Jonah expressed, look at the faith that Jonah employed. Jonah's whole attitude has been continually changing. You see, he ran away from God and then God stopped his running. He realized in the boat in the midst of a storm he was the problem. And so he said to the men, throw me overboard. So they threw him overboard. And then God had appointed, designated a great fish to swallow him up. And then he had been in the belly of this great fish. And his attitude is now changing. God did this. His conscience was touched. He gave the whole situation some serious thought. And this man, who had lost both his identity and his testimony, a man who had compromised his position, is now going 
to recover his faith. That's the lovely thing about God. You might say, Pastor, I've been on the run from God, and you've been saying this every week. I'm tired listening to it, because that's where I am, and who cares? God cares. That's the thing. He's a God of grace and a God of great mercy, a God with a heart of abundant love. God doesn't want you there. God wants you back where you need to be, and God wants to use you as he pleases. He's not finished with you yet, and if you give up on God, I'm going to tell you now, God will not give up on you. He'll chase you. And he'll do things in your life that you don't understand. And he'll speak by his spirit and he'll hit your conscience and he'll say to you, look, stop for a wee moment and think how you got here. And then have a serious think about where you're actually going. You could Jonah for a moment. Look at his admission. Jonah simply says, then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Not only has it dawned in Jonah that on the boat he was the problem and in the fish he had gone away from God and God had brought this all about. Jonah says, I am cast out of thy self. Do you remember way back at the very beginning? Remember how Jonah had gone down into Joppa, got his ticket, Get on the boat and headed out towards Tarsus, some 3,000 miles perhaps away from where he should have been. And it seems now to Jonah, he has achieved exactly what he set out to do. He has achieved it. He had arrived at the place where he wanted to be because you know what? He does really feel within himself God has cast him off forever. God has cast him off forever. Jonah was so conscious of his guilt, so aware of what he has done, he now thinks and feels he has pushed God too far. And perhaps God was so far away from him, he felt there was no real point in praying at all. Beloved, you know one of the worst things that God can give us in life and one of the worst things that could ever happen to us as Christians in life is when God gives us what we want, even though he knows it's not for our good. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, take Israel for an example quickly. God chose Israel on the basis of his grace, not because they were bigger than any other nation, for they weren't. They were the least important nation of them all. And God took this nation, brought them to himself. He blessed them. He led them. He fed them. He encouraged them, even when they rebelled against him. And you know what? The psalmist reminds us there came a time when they forgot about God. And God gave them the desire of their hearts. But it wasn't good for them. Sometimes like Jonah, we take matters into our own hands. We do what we think is best for us. We stop looking to God for guidance. We stop reading, praying, and we become indifferent to spiritual things. And even though we know we're doing wrong, we continue to do it. Child of God like Jonah will eventually be found out. We'll begin to understand it's not a good place to be. If you go back into the world and feed your soul in the world, you'll not only become worldly, but you'll use your spirituality. You can't Run life like that. You can't do two things. You either live in the world like the world or you live for Christ. And sometimes God allows us to get into the world again. Thinking we never learned a lesson the first time, but we maybe learn it the second time. 
that what we need is God. Nothing more, nothing less, just God. God. I've met Christians who have said to me, you know what, yes, I love Jesus, but he doesn't give me everything I want. I tell you, friend, if Jesus doesn't give you everything you want, you don't love Jesus. Jesus Christ has come to give us life in all its abundance, to give us everything we need this side of eternity, to prepare us for heaven and home. Don't need anything else. We don't need anyone else. And Johnny here had to realize not only was he found out, he was in a place where it was not a good place to be. We see his admission, we see his assurance, and I love these words, you see, because it gives us all hope. Here's what Jonah said. I will look again. I will look again toward thy holy temple. You can almost see Jonah here and he's in distress and he has admitted his peril and it's almost as if he's trying to get his hands up toward God and say, Lord, I've learned my lesson. I will look again toward thy holy temple. Jonah's faith now begins to shine through. He makes sense of what is happening. In the midst of despair, there's a little glimmer of light shines into his heart. He sees light at the end of his tunnel, and now he says, my hope is in God. My hope is in God. Oh, he was overcome by fear, but only for a moment. He simply turned back to the God that he had departed from, and in the midst of his darkness, he submitted to God's sovereignty. See, beloved, that's the thing about life. Whenever we focus on God, things don't seem so bleak. Whenever we lose sight of God, everything, everything in life crams in around us and we find ourselves in dark days in the midst of despair and like Jonah wondering why. Well I can assure you if that's where you're at today God has not cast you off and God will see you through if you look to him. Someone has said faith is the means by which the impunity of man lays hold of the infinity of God. You see, beloved, faith is to believe what we don't see. Faith is to trust when we don't understand. Faith is to take God at his word, even if things seem impossible to us. You say, Pastor, that's great, but you're not where I am. No, but you don't know whether I am or not. You might, like Jonah, say, Pastor, I feel cut off from God. I feel when I look at my life, all hope is gone. I feel that God's not interested in me anymore and nobody else, even in this church, seems to care. You're wrong. You're wrong. Why do I say you're wrong? Because child of God... God cares. And if you hear nothing else this morning in your distress, hear this. He will never cast us off. He will never abandon his children. He'll always give us hope if we trust him. He'll always be near even if we cannot feel his presence. Standing somewhere in the shadow, you'll find Jesus. And he'll always care about us even if nobody else cares. Remember how in the Old Testament in Isaiah the people were in great distress and God said, fear not, I've redeemed thee, I've called thee by name, thou art mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. 
Through the rivers they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee, for I am the Lord thy God. Are you overwhelmed this morning in your Christian life? Faith is weak and wavering. Hope almost gone. Future looks bleak. I don't have the strength to go on, but then I say to you today, look to the promises of God. Corrie Ten Boom, and I'll finish with this, was born on the 15th of April, 1892 in the Netherlands. Her father was a jeweler and he was so fascinated by the craft of watchmaking and so engrossed often in his work that he actually forgot to charge customers whenever they came for his services. Corey trained to be a watchmaker herself. In 1922, she became the first woman to be licensed as a watchmaker in the Netherlands. However, the Second World War came. And in May 1940, the Germans invaded the Netherlands. Corey and her sister Betsy, They opened up their home to Jewish refugees and to members of the resistance movement. But in September 44, Corrie and her sister Betsy were arrested and taken to a concentration camp and they stayed together until her sister Betsy died. Corrie was released in late December 1944. She was reunited with the surviving members of her family She had gone through a terrible experience. And like Jonah, she put it into words. Here's what she said. I have experienced his presence in the deepest hell that man can create. I have really tested the promises of the Bible. And believe me, you can count on them. Isn't that wonderful? You can count on the promises of God. The hymn writer says, Be not dismayed, whatever betide. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you. Through days of toil, when the heart doth feel, God will take care of you. When dangers fierce your path a seal, God will take care of you. Through every day or all the way, God will take care of you. Let's pray together for a moment. Father, we've been thinking about Jonah now for a number of weeks. And we find him today in the worst place he could ever have been as far as he was concerned. In great distress. And yet God saw his servant there. And God ministered to him. And Father, maybe some of us are sitting here this morning, whether it be of our own making, or whether it be that we're living lives that are impeccable and still, we find ourselves in distress. Father, would you help us to look heavenward to a God who really cares, to a God who is able to meet us at the point of our need, to a God who says today my promises are enough. You can trust them. Wherever you find us today, we pray, but we'll remember your word, respond to it. And all we ask our Father is that each one of us might live where you want us to be and do what you want us to do. For Christ our Savior's sake we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing a lovely hymn in closing this morning. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. Let's think about the words as we sing them.
Father, may we feel and find that covering hand today over us in the midst of all that we're facing in life just now. If we need lifted up, our Father, we pray that you will lift us up and give us the strength to go on. If we're failed and we feel there's no hope and no point, Father, there's always hope. And there's always point in going on. So help us today to look on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Help us just today to glean in our own personal lives what we need. And give us grace to apply it that we might know this week that underneath and round about us are the everlasting arms of a loving God. Bless those who leave us now. Take them home safely. Bless those of us who wait around the Lord's table. We give you our thanks for time spent together here today in Jesus' name. Amen.